Um, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, from wherever you're joining us today. Okay. So uh, my name is Leonor Shikune, and I'm the Communications Director of IWRA. We are the International Water Resources Association. So I'm delighted to be here with you today to kick off our first masterclass. Um, on behalf of the International Water Resources Association, I want to welcome our participants and partners who have joined us here today. We're thrilled to have you here, and we're looking forward to engaging with you throughout the coming weeks. I would also like to express our sincere gratitude to our partners, the Human Right to Water and South Africa's Water Research Commission. Without their invaluable collaboration, this masterclass series would not have been possible. At IWRA, we believe that timely collaboration is, in, is essential to tackle the global water challenges of our time. Since 2021, we have hosted a series of masterclasses. These masterclasses are based on themes of timely interest in the water sector, and we collaborate with leading water institutions to offer an online series of masterclasses on these themes. Today, we're thrilled to launch this year's virtual masterclasses on institutional responsibility to support SDG 6 and the rights to water and sanitation. As we all know, Access to clean water and sanitation is a fundamental human right. Yet this right is still not fully realized in many parts of the world. This masterclass is designed to help authorities and businesses improve their relationships with the community and support sustainable development goals. Moreover, the course will provide a practical approach for integrating a human rights-based approach to meet corporate sustainability to, Gil to Gilliden standards. Lastly, I would like to encourage all of you to sign up for the workshops if you have not already by becoming an IWI member. The workshops will take place right after the public uh, lectures. By signing up to become an IWI member, you'll not only gain access to all the masterclass workshops, but you'll also unlock a range of exclusive benefits such as discounted registration to future IWI Congress events and leading an IWI task force or chapter. So I encourage you to please visit our website at iwra.org to learn more. Thank you once again for joining us today and we hope you enjoy this masterclass series. I'll now hand over to one of the lecturers to give a short introduction and kick us off. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Yuri Rampisu. I work for the South African Human Rights Commission. It's a national human rights institution. Um, in Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm the head of the Economic and Social Rights Unit um, at the Commission. So I will be doing the introduction to this masterclass and afterwards I will hand over to Luxon. I'm going to share my screen and just for now switch off my camera, thanks. Uh, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, this is a partnership between the South African Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Water and the Water Research Commission. So I am going to kick off this masterclass on the human right to water on sustainable development goal six, and I'm going to touch on um, a human rights based approach to business. Okay, the human right to water. What is a human right that is enshrined in explicitly in the South African constitution? And for decades, it's also been implicitly enshrined in international instruments, various inst international instruments. It is essential to the survival of life on earth for everyone, including humans. And it is essential to the existence of livelihoods, societies, and ecosystems. Its access and availability are under threat, however, due to climate change, the increasing demand from a growing population and poor water management. On 28 July, 2010, the United Nations General Assembly, Assembly explicitly recognized the human right to water and sanitation and acknowledged that clean drinking water and sanitation are essential to the realization of all human rights. The lack of access to potable, potable water violates the right to one's dignity. From a human rights perspective, the right to water and sanitation is essential for the eradication of poverty and inequality. And the lack of access to water compromises all poverty and inequality alleviation strategies that any states or businesses employ. Therefore, water and poverty are inextricably linked. Water is a critical resource for the poor 
and plays a key role in many aspects of their livelihood. A lack of access to water greatly impacts other rights, such as the right to food, a healthy environment, health, and education. In much of the research done by the South African Human Rights Commission, we found that hospitals often go without water, particularly in rural areas, violating the right to health for various people. But we also found that at an individual level, often chronically ill patients do not have access to potable water, um, preventing them from taking their medication. This was particularly difficult with people suffering with HIV or AIDS. In addition, the impact of a lack of water disproportionately affects certain groups of people, such as women, girls, and people with disability. Again, in research done by the Human Rights Commission, we find found that girls often drop out of school um, for chores, such as collecting water, and when they start menstruating because they don't have access to water in their schools. The Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals emanate from the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is a broad plan of action for people, planet, and pros prosperity articulated through the Sustainable Development Goals. These are essentially goals for the alleviation of poverty, inequality, and broad um, development. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals are broad aspirations for achieving this 2030 Agenda. It aims to do this through 17 goals, 170 targets, and 230 indicators. The SDGs were also optimally designed to take forward and improve on its predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals, which had not been greatly successful in its aim of improving the lives of the world's poorest people. Many believe that this was because the Millennium Development Goals were not human rights based and did not consider the most marginalized and vulnerable in our society. The 2030 Agenda recognizes the centrality of water resources to sustainable development and the vital role that improved drinking water, sanitation and hygiene play in the progress in other areas of human rights, such as health, education, and poverty reduction. Importantly, Sustainable Development Goal 6 goes beyond the recognition of drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene as the most important factors for addressing access to water. It also includes quality and sustainability of water resources, which are critical to the survival of people and the planet. It's also important to note that the Sustainable Development Goals are interlinked, noting that one goal relies on the realization of other goals, such as the reduction of carbon emissions in our environment or the keeping climate change, um, uh, redu uh, limiting climate change. Specifically on Sustainable Development Goal 6. Sustainable Development Goal 6 calls on states and people to ensure availability and the sustainable management and wa of water and sanitation for all. Some ensuring that no one is left behind. Some of the notable targets under goal six include, by 2030, achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. Noting that its predecessor, the Millennium, Millennium Development Goal, only sought to halve the proportion of people without access to water. Achieve access and adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all and end open defecation, paying special attention to the needs of women and girls and those in vulnerable situations. Improve water quality by reducing pollution, eliminating dumping and minimizing the release of hazardous chemicals and materials halving the population of uh, the proportion of untreated wastewater and substantially increasing recycling and safe reuse globally. Substantially increasing water use efficiency across all sectors and ensuring sustainable withdrawals and supply of fresh water to address water scarcity 
and substantially reduce the number of people suffering from water scarcity. And finally, support and strengthen and part the participation of local communities in improving water and sanitation management. So those are some of the notable targets under sustainable goal, uh, sustainable development goal six. In 2016, the Human Rights Council adopted a resolution where it expressed concern at the negative impact that a lack of access of water and sanitation and hygiene was having on health and mortality. The council recognizes the challenges faced by women and girls in accessing water and sanitation, particularly during their menstrual cycle, and that the deprivation of the right reinforces widespread stigma associated with menstruation. This in turn often impacts on both the right to education, health, and other human rights. The resolutions highlighted above by the Human Rights Council requires states to work towards the universal access for all to water without discrimination, using human, a human rights-based service delivery as a basis for the provision of, the water, of, of this resource. This includes factors such as availability, accessibility, affordability, quality, safety, acceptability, and more. Currently, our global standards for access to safe drinking water are not good. Globally, three out of 10 people do not have access to safe drinking water. About half of the people drinking water from unprotected sources live in Sub-Saharan Africa. Six out of 10 people do not have access to safely managed sanitation services, and one out of nine practice of open defecation. The duty therefore lies with various role players to realize the goal and targets under SDG 6. What are the challenges in water service delivery? Um, this research, um, I think some of the trends are global, but the research is mostly regional and local. So we know water usage is increasing due to population increases and irrigation expansion. Water use has been increasing worldwide by about 1% since the 1980s, 80s, driven by a combination of population growth, socioeconomic development, and changing consumption patterns. Global water demand is expected to continue increasing at a similar rate until at least 2050, accounting for an increase of between 20 to 30% above the current level of water use, mainly due to a rising demand in the industrial and domestic sectors. So the main challenges in water service delivery at present can be summarized accordingly. Discrimination. You have direct and indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination is when laws, policies, and practices impact the access for particular groups of people based on some ground such as race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and more. Um, and these are often written into laws, policies, and practices. There's also indirect discrimination. And this occurs when, for example, a lack of provision impacts the right of access for a particular group of people, such as the lack of provision in schools, lack of provision of water in schools, and the impact that this has on girls attending school. Governance. Poor governance structures mean that there's a lack of accountability, transparency, access to information, and more. Because the state at a national level cannot provide water to all at a local level, as it is often more involved in the development of legislation, policies, and programs, there's a lack of effective governance, particularly when private sector companies are tasked with service delivery. Good governance relates to systems that have qualities of accountability, transparency, legitimacy, public participation, justice, and efficiency, and therefore overlaps with the principles of a human rights-based approach to service delivery. Good water governance involves measures and mechanisms that promote effective policy implementation 
along with sanctions against poor performance, illegal acts and abuses of power. Holding decision makers accountable requires ability, willingness and preparedness among rights holders or their representatives to scrutinize actions and non-actions. This in turn builds on transparency, integrity and access to information. We often find um, example, for example, in South Africa, when private sector companies are tasked with the provision of water at a local level, these companies are paid for the services. They either uh, provide um, shoddy services or do not provide services at all, but are often never held accountable for their lack of service delivery and that money is wasted. So that's an example of a private sector not being held accountable. Economic factors, the requirement of payment and lack of available funds for poorer communities and household in, uh, indigent households is an example of um, a lack of economic means to provide services. So for example, in South Africa, local government funds are allocated um, to all spheres of government, that's national, provincial, and local through the equitable share and local government is expected to gather additional revenue through revenue co collection from households and companies. However, this is not always sufficient to meet the needs of communities, particularly poor communities with large numbers of indigent households and often in rural areas. Um, therefore, there is a very unequal level of access to water and sanitation. The urban rural divide, there's a critical need for the provision of services to rural areas. Often rural areas are neglected or they lack capacity, skills and resources for service delivery. This urban rural divide exacerbates existing poverty and inequality. The South African Local Government Association in South Africa, for example, has spoken about the issues they have with ensuring that there are skills at, uh, in rural areas and retaining skills at that level, um, which leads to problems in service delivery. Poor planning. Municipalities do not always have annual performance plans and or maintenance plans for their water infrastructure. They are often not aware of the state of infrastructure or service delivery in their respective constituencies and lack the will, skills, resources or more to conduct the requisite audits to ensure improved planning. And then there's the lack of political will or just a lack of impetus to ensure that resources are effectively allocated um, and then to ensure that there's accountability once these resources have been allocated and money spent. So what is the human rights-based approach case for business? According to the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, under a human rights-based approach, the plans, policies, and processes of development are anchored in a system of rights and corresponding obligations established by international law. This helps promote the sustainability of development work, empowering people themselves, especially the most marginalized, to participate in policy formulation and hold accountable those who have a duty to act. A human rights-based approach to service delivery advocates for the fundamental standards, principles, and criteria of a human rights framework. This includes non-discrimination and participation that is active, free, and meaningful, as well as representative by and for people in disadvantaged or vulnerable situations. It also includes mechanisms for access to information, transparency, and accountability and in some cases, a grievance, grievance mechanism, particularly in the case of a private company. In addition to the moral imperative of companies to integrate a human rights-based approach to business, it is also found to be good for business. In rethinking its position in society as a role player in economic, social, and environmental development, and as a member of community, the discourse on business and, and human rights progressively evolves so that it benefits all role players. According to the Office on, of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, 
This approach can res result in one or more of the following for the private sector. Improved stakeholder relations, improved employee recruitment, retention, and motivation, improved risk assessment and management, reduced risk of, of consumer protests, enhanced corporate reputation and brand image, a more secure license to operate, strengthened shareholder confidence, more sustainable business relationships with government, business partners, trade unions, subcontractors, and suppliers. The commission has also noted a greater buy-in projects by communities when a company is transparent, approachable, accountable, and engaging. This leads to a more sustainable outcome for all service delivery projects for the business and the community. So ultimately, it is in the interest of all role players, including the private sector, to commit to a human rights-based approach to service delivery of water and sanitation. This approach has shown to have to reach and if the most effective, equitable, and sustainable outcome for communities, countries, and society as a whole. Thank you. I now hand over to Luxon to take over. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, my name is Lakso Namo. I'm from the Water Research Commission. And the, I'm just going to proceed from where Yuri ended. It's quite interesting, yes. Uh, water is a basic commodity, it is a basic need, and it's a human right enshrined in the constitutions and the nationally and internationally that's where we've got SDG, sdg6 so that's where we are sitting here today and the, i prepared this presentation with my colleagues from the water research commission uh, mainly some colleagues and sylvester mpandeli who are not here but he, they are well presented with my other colleagues who prepared this presentation, Tiani Chaoke and Mamso Ding, who are here as well. Well, these are the contents of my presentation today. Uh, I will touch base on the global state of the water and the ecosystems, then the state of water from a South Africa perspective, then adaptation and resilience, then public-private partnerships, that is investment, then transformative and secular approaches and on how they can uh, be used or how they can enhance uh, achieving a sustainable development goals, particularly goal six. Then I will just come up with a framework and a process of action. Right, from a global perspective, most of the world's population currently lives in water scarce countries, as we can see from the map on the right there, the red and the yellow is, is mainly representing countries that are water scarce. And this map was developed more than 10 years ago. It was a projection of what was happening. We developed this map when I was still with the International Water Management Institute. And the, what it is today is exactly almost the, the same situation, the state of affairs in as far as global water security is concerned. So most of the world's population, I'm saying, is lives in water scarce countries. And as a result, over 80% of the global population live in water insecure countries. And these are mainly in, in Africa, Asia, South America. That is the global south. What we are calling these days the global south. That is where uh, most of the water insecure countries are. And the, yeah, the distribution of water resources is very uneven in the world. And we can find out that um, most of the water resources are transboundary in nature, but you find from the map that we are divided into countries and each country will try to protect its resources that are within its uh, environs. 
and this has also caused a lot of problems. I will talk about that. I can actually give an example of the Nile River, which is starting the Sudan there, and what is happening in Ethiopia, the war in Ethiopia after the building of the Renaissance Dam, and the, which is affecting water availability in, in Egypt. I'll talk about that later. It is causing a lot of tension at the moment. Then globally, globally all regions face a trajectory of low levels of water security due to a range of compounding factors. These include climate change, increasing population, increasing irrigated area, which uses a lot of water. And yeah, those are some of the challenges. And also more than 10% of people do not have access to basic drinking water as we speak. I took this from a recent report from the United Nations University on, on the state of water resources in the world. So, and more than 70% do not have access to, safe, to safely manage the drinking water services. That is SDG target 6.1. And going on, uh, on the right there, I list some um, the ESDG six targets. For example, SDG six point six point one by twenty thirty to achieve universal and adequate access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. But what is the state? Are we achieving these goals? Are we achieving these targets? How, how far are we going with the setting the targets? At present, this is the present situation, the world's water-related uh, ecosystems, these are very important, they provide the ecosystem services. Over the, uh, over the past 300 years, over 85% of the planet's wetlands have been lost, 85%. And the meeting, which means meeting drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene targets by 2030 requires us to work four times from what we are doing at the moment, which is a mammoth task already. We are almost 10 years in the SDGs, but we are already lacking. And at the current pace, at the current pace, by 2030, 106, 1.6 billion people will be strictly, uh, will, will not meet the, the targets. Let me just try to move this, which is blocking me. Let's hope I'll be able to do that and move it. Okay. I was saying 1.6 billion people will lack uh, safely managed the drinking water by 2030, if, at the pace that we are going now. Then 2.8 billion people who lack safely managed sanitation, and 1.9 billion people who lack basic uh, hand hygiene facil facilities by 2030, which means we are off target with the with the sustainable meeting sustainable development goals. Okay. Okay. So uh, after talking about the a perspective from South Africa, from the globe. Now I just want to highlight our situation in South Africa. I'm resident in South Africa. So I'm more of this. They've been working in the water sector for more than 20 years in South Africa. So I'm going to talk briefly. I'm trying, I'm going to be trying to be fast trying to, uh, to cover the time. So for South Africa's case, South Africa is a water scarce country and ranked the, th the third driest country in the world. And rainfall distribution, as you can see on the map of South Africa there, the distribution, just like the global trend as well, rainfall distribution in South Africa is uneven, varying from less than 50 millimeters in the Northwest to more than 3,000 millimeters in the coastal mountains of the country. And the country is an average rainfall of about 40% less than the annual world average. But we use in South Africa 61.8% more water per day than the world average of 175 liters. And the average annual rainfall of less than 500 millimeters is less than world average of about 
850 meters. So we you can see the situation for South Africa is, is dire at the moment. So it means we would need to use our resources efficiently and to make sure that uh, each, it's a, a, a what is a human right and it's enshrined in the constitution of the Republic. And the, but as we speak now, there are towns and the cities that are purely uh, uh, getting water from the, from the ground. They are using groundwater resources entirely. And the, although groundwater resources are well in South Africa is still unknown, 13% of the country's freshwater resources come from groundwater, of which 59% is used in irrigation. So you see the disparity, but we don't know how much water we are depleting and how much is it, it is uh, if it is sustainable. Uh, next slide, Yuri. Right. Also, I'm continuing with the situation in South Africa. At the moment, 90, 98% of the available freshwater resources in the country are already allocated in the country, leaving little room for economic growth. And the nation, yet the National Development Plan proposes to increase the irrigated area by 45,000 hectares by 2030. But the question is, we are saying 98% of water resources are already uh, allocated. Where is the water going to come from? And all this is happening in a country where 36% of water supplied is non-revenue non revenue water, water that is not accounted for, water that is supplied to industry and for, to, for domestic use, municipal non revenue water stands at 36%, which equates to 7.2 billion rands per annum. That's huge. So we need to improve on that. Then climate change pressures continue to exacerbate existing, some of these existing challenges. Then again, there's another map that was developed some years ago showing water stress in a country, in the country. For example, we can see our state in South Africa. South Africa is in the high stressed water country, countries in the world. And based on population and economic growth, a projections for South Africa indicated that demand will outstrip supply by 17% by 2030. It's not very fast, seven years from now. And agriculture already consumes over 60% of available freshwater resources and globally, globally it is 70%, which is so huge. It means we need to develop innovative smart technologies to enhance water use efficient in the, in the agriculture sector. Then we've got the uh, national challenges of recurring droughts. South Africa is a drought prone country where we know what happened in 2015, 2016 in Cape Town when we almost approached day zero. And as a result of all these challenges, the country that did not just sit, we, we partnered with the, uh, the private sector that is the public and private sector partnership that developed the tools on, on, the, on, on the meeting some of the water needs in the country. That is in 2015, the country developed what we call the Water Research Development and Innovation Roadmap. It's a tool, of course, it is in the, under the custodianship of the Department of Water and Technology, Department of Water and Sanitation and the Water Research Commission, but it, it's a national roadmap that it drives uh, water use efficiency in the country, mainly water demand and supply. Next slide, Yuri. Then the, this water roadmap is supported by uh, some legal frameworks, nationally, regionally, and internationally. For example, I said it addresses the water supply and the water, I'm not going to talk much about what it does, what it aims. Maybe this presentation will be shared later, I'm not sure, with the organizers. Uh, but it addresses mainly four water supply 
thematic clusters and two, three water demand thematic clusters. And these clusters are in compliance with the constitution, the National Development Plan, the National Water Act, and the National Water Resources Strategy 2. And there's now strategy number three. And internationally, it addresses its responses to the Convention on the Law of Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses, also Sustainable Development Goal number six, then at the African Union Agenda 20, excuse the three, then the SADAC Region Water Policy, then the SADAC Revised Pro Protocol on Shared Water Courses. You can proceed, Yuri, next slide. Okay. Besides all these challenges, we have some internal issues that we also need to address if ever we are going to meet the SDG6 targets. You know, South Africa is the, one of the most unequal societies in the world. And besides that, we have a lot of poverty and inequality in, in the country. And you find that there is a lot of unemployment, 32% of unemployment that is so huge. Then the crumbling infrastructure, which needs to be renovated. And the resource intense economy, we use a lot of resources and we are still using the linear approach. I'm going to talk a bit about that linearity and secularity. I'm going to, to talk about that. That is the transformative approaches. Then the special divide is so big, poor education, high disease burden. South Africa has, has got some disease hotspots. What happened in Wuhan in 2019 there didn't come as a surprise to scientists, but it was already spotted that it's a disease emerging, emergence of uh, infectious diseases hotspot. And South Africa has got some spots as well. Then poor public services, we have had a lot of problems with that. Corruption is a problem, then divided communities. But the primary drivers to the challenges is climate change, increasing population, which is causing demand to outstrip supply. Then increasing irrigated area, we will need to continue feeding the nation, but at the moment, 50% of households are food insecure, though at national level, we are food secure. Then demand outstripping supply, that is um, water. So what is a basic, we can see where that other picture in the middle there of an informal settlement, how can you actually supply a, Water, water to such a settlement. These are some of the issues that we need to address. This could be a time bomb. Next slide, Yuri. Okay. Therefore, we need to build water resilience, water climate proofing in the in the country. Not only in South Africa. I was going through some documents. All the world countries are focusing water shortages. I was reading a document from the United Kingdom, and the, the private sector is heavily involved, and they have actually developed a, a strategy to assist the, the government. But it, it, this is actually needed. Maybe next slide, Yuri. This one, I'm not going to talk much. And there's need, however, what I want to express here is that there is need for close public-private partnership. The private should lag behind and leave everything to the public sector. For, yeah, there's a lot that needs to be done. There's not, at, at the present level, the funding that is there, there's under investment. That is, that is the, what I'm concluding on this, on this slide. There's under investment, which needs to be improved. And if we don't do anything, the consequences we will see them very soon in the near future. Next slide. Sorry, I'm trying to rush a bit, but these are some of the actions and interventions that need to be done in or if we are ever to achieve the, the human rights for water to make sure that everyone accesses water, waters are made available to everyone without leaving anyone be, behind. The private sector should prioritize water use efficiency across 
operations by installing best practice technologies for water conservation, particularly in water scarce areas. Then mitigating against water pollution with the state of the art waste water treatment processes for effluent discharge, you know, with the food production and the manufacturing industry, the private sector is actually polluting our water resources. Then development of innovative manufacturing processes such that sub substances with the high water contamination potential are eliminated and substituted with materials that are easier to remove from the water. You know, there, is, there are a lot that can be done in order to make sure that the private sector uh, contributes to, to water use efficiency and to make sure that water is made avail available to everyone. Next slide, Yuri. Right, this is just a, sorry for that, there's a pop-up. Uh, this is just a roadmap on how the SDGs came forth in 2015. We were just trying to highlight what happened. If you see the red, if you can see my mouse there, you can see the, the, the 2011 World Economic Forum that was a demarcation before 2011 and what happened after 2015 and with the, the formulation and the adoption of the sustainable development goals by the United Nations General Council. So in what happened in before it was more, there was more of sector centric approaches. And the, we, that is when we had the, the integrated water resources uh, management and the, we, it was more of a linear economy. But after that, the SDGs, remember the basis, there are three basic commodities or resources that made that made the SDGs to be to have for us to have the SDGs, that is water, energy, and food. We, we realize that uh, if we continue with the norm, we are going to have a serious shortage, shortages of these resources and in some countries. It's a real, a real big problem with the three resources, water, energy, and food. But after 2015, science recognized that there is need of cross-sectoral cross approaches that is transform, transformational change, to change, a complete change from the way we do things. That is circular economy to make sure that resources remain in use for, for longer periods. Um, next slide, Yuri. Okay, secularity, an alternative towards water sustainability by 2030. I was just trying to show the difference between linear and monocentric approaches and secular and polycentric approaches. Sector, linear approaches, they are sector-based based resources planning and management tools. They are divergent, they promote a divergent sector based policies, you see, you see each department or each ministry running with, with its policy. For example, I said the NDP National Development Plan proposes to increase the irrigated area by 45,000 45, hectares. But where is the water? That's the question. And where is the energy? Do you have the energy? Where is the energy going to come from? So that is linear. It aggravates, linear pre-economy aggravates a contemporary crisis, the crisis that we are having at the moment, the challenges, they are actually exacerbated, compounded by linear approaches. They have been very helpful for, for quite some time, but they have reached their limit at the moment. And they focus on the present situation without mirroring into the future. Yet secular approaches, they are cross-sectorial. When there is a planning, there, there is need to look into all sectors together. If you see the spider graph there, this is a model that we did at the Water Research Commission uh, when we are trying to assess water, uh, water, energy, and food resources. And in 2015 and 2018, you know, in 2015, there was that drought. So there was more emphasis on, 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 on water resources. But with the time, you see, that, that changed when we had a lot of water now, 
a lot of rains and we are focusing on other things. You see, there's always any balance. So we need to address this. This is more technical. Proceed, Yuri. Okay. And why transformative approaches in attaining rights to water? Why? Why? Because there are th uh, four thematic areas that we need to consider. The drivers of change, risk and exposure, preparedness and recovery, adaptation and resilience. The drivers of change, I've already spoken about them, and the, uh, the risk, the rapid urbanization, climate change, agriculture expansion, and population growth. And the risks are that more than 50% of the population is food insecure in South Africa. This is an example of South Africa. And 86% of the country's energy comes from coal, which is very unacceptable. And there's threat of novel infectious diseases, for example, the COVID-19. And 98% of the country's water resources are already allocated. You see, there's a link between these water, energy, food, and the threat of pandemics, infectious diseases, diseases that we, we didn't know of. So how do we prepare for this? We prepare these two transformative approaches or secular models. These include nexus planning. Nexus planning can include water, energy, food. Nexus can include water, water, health, environment. Nexus, a lot of nexuses that are available are out there. This also includes the scenario planning. Scenario planning is essential because it removes uncertainty. And there are a lot of scenarios that you can come up with. If this happens, we quickly do this. Also, one health, just the transition. We can actually, when we are in such a forum, we can just say, just water transition. Then there's the secular economy. I don't want to draw much on this, but also sustainable food system. If we use this modeling system, the secular approaches, transformative approaches, there will be water, energy, and food security. It will enhance resilience and adaptation and improve livelihoods and nutrition. Next slide, Yuri. Okay, this is another one of the Nexus approaches. It's almost the same, but it's very interesting because of my time. But it's the, what we call, we also developed this year, the Water Research Commission. We call it Water, Health, Environment, and Nutrition Nexus. Next slide, Yuri. Okay, what are the fundamental requirements for providing water and sanitation? One, it's about capacity building to have adequate numbers of skilled human resources with decent working conditions. Africa, for example, is known for developing a good skilled people, but we are not able to retain them. You see Western countries, they are just South Africa, Africa, not South Africa, Africa is just a hunting ground for our skilled workforce to go overseas. Then another fundamental requirement, water, sanitation, hygiene, health care, waste management. We must be able to, to make sure that the waste is not just waste. We need to recycle it. Then energy, to make sure that we use sustainable energy services. Then infrastructure, technologies, and the products to make sure that appropriate infrastructure, technologies, products, processes, including all the operations that flow for efficient functioning, of the health care facility. You can go to the next slide, Yuri. Okay, I think this is my last slide. It's just a framework that we developed, the, the, that we have just to make sure to provide the pathways on how to, uh, to make sure that um, water is availed and accessed by all oh, by 2030 is just to make sure that we assemble and train a multi-sectorial operative team, capacity building, establish the balance. We must have that balance, transformative approaches, not just to go, for example, what happened in 2020, 2022 there during the pandemic, the focus was on health issues and we forgot that we, this could result in my dear people effects later. That is the reason why we have got 32% of unemployment in South Africa, a huge death 
energy crisis and the food prices are going up and so forth. So that's, those are the consequences. We just create optimal efficiency in one sector, the health sector, yet we are just transferring those challenges to other sectors. Then number two, three is to define and prioritize a short and long-term interventions through transformative approaches, secular models. Develop, number four, develop and implement an improved plan. For example, the water road development, water research development innovation roadmap. Then monitor and evaluate improvements. We need a monitoring and evaluation framework. These are some of the action um, points that we need to do. Next slide, Yuri. For further readings, these are some of the books that we have been published at the Water Research Commission. The first one we published together with our partners. The second one is entirely a Water Research Commission book, which, is, uh, which will be available in the next month or so. Next slide, Shibibe, thank you. Thank you so much to all the participants for the time. This work needs us all. It's uh, not a one-man affair or it's not for the government. As I say, I was uh, emphasizing in my presentation, we need all to take part. So this is thank you to the organizers, uh, Human Rights to Water, International Water Resources Association, and the Water Research Commission for organizing this and looking forward uh, to such kind of collaborations. This is quite relevant and necessary. Uh, together we can achieve more. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.